So my name is Cecilia Tapper and I come from Sustainable Business Hub in Malmö, Sweden, and we are one of the partners in the Low Temp project. Uh, I have been the work package leader for uh, the activities uh, covering issues such as uh, funding and uh, business models for low temperature district heating. And Britta has asked me to talk about economic framework for low temperature district heating today. Uh, when we talk about the economic framework for low temperature district heating, we have to start with looking at what are uh, the physical as assets of district heating in general. And as um, I'm sure that um, you all know quite a lot about, uh, there are three main categories of assets. We have the assets uh, used for producing or generating energy and heat for the district heating network. We have the distribution grid, which helps us to bring the heat from the uh, from the energy production plants to the customer, and we have the installations that take place um, uh, at the customer, which could, for instance, be the installation and operation of a substation or heat exchanger. And this also includes the metering and billing. So this is really what the uh, cost side or where the cost impact takes place uh, in, a, in a business model for district heating. Uh, and if you look at many of the district heating operate in Europe uh, and in our region and in, uh, uh, in the Baltic Sea region, the generation and distribution is owned by the same company. So the same district heating utility, they both own the district heating grid and they have the major generation assets, which could be power, um, which could be district heating power uh, plants, but also combined heat and power plants. If we then shift to, to the other side of um, the district heating business case, we, we look at the classic revenue streams. And of course, the most obvious one is the heat tariffs. And the heat tariff um, is commonly um, composed of three different um, um, of th of three different components. Well, one is the connection charge, which is the one-off charge that the customer pays when signing up to become um, a district heating customer. And this connection charge could sometimes be waived or discounted uh, to attract more customers uh, to the district heating grid and also to get a better coverage in certain areas. And uh, Rolf men mentioned this as an example from Halmstad Energy and Environment earlier, where they have given discounts for, um, you know, looking at giving discounts to the customers in the new area, which they are building out to ensure that they get a lot of customers. Uh, there is often a fixed annual amount that the customer pays, which is independent of the amount of heat and cooling that that specific customer is using. But uh, the level or the amount could differ between different customer categories. And then it is the variable element, the cost that we pay for the actual energy or the actual heat that we consume in our, in our buildings. Uh, many district heating companies, of course, operate CHP plants and then also revenues from electricity will be an important revenue streams uh, for district heating. This is the main cost and income side for district heating. But if we look at district heating, there are some clear market challenges. District heating is often very large scale and it's a long term investments. And it can be a challenge to find um, to find the funding or financing these type of projects to, since the investor needs to be willing uh, to accept a very long term return on the investments. Uh, here, public organizations like municipalities who own their own utilities can be very important players because they have a long-term obligation in the area uh, or in the geography of their municipality. Um, so that is one big challenge. Uh, another challenge uh, which is very obvious at this point and which we have heard many of the the, f the previous speakers talk about is that climate mitigation um, requires us 
to shift to more sustainable energy sources in our district heating systems. In some countries like Sweden, where I come from, of course, we have had a shift to, to biomass and biofuels, uh, which, which started uh, some decades ago. Uh, but in some countries, this is still very common to use fossil fuels. And the climate mitigation or the climate obligation that we have, um, it can both be stated by a national government, like for instance, Denmark and Finland, that has taken decisions to ban um, coal, uh, generation of coal. Uh, it could also be um, generated by uh, tax policies, and it could be the own companies or municipalities having ambitious climate goals that makes them want to shift to new energy sources. But this requires large investments. If you look at the demand side, uh, climate mitigation policies are also driving energy efficiency measures. Uh, and this reduces the energy demand uh, on the customer side, and it can also reduce the need for high supply temperatures. And that is both valid when it comes to major refurbishment of uh, existing buildings, but of course it is also a big factor when it comes to um, the building, uh, when constructing new buildings. And as all energy sources, the district heating providers, they face market competition. In many places, the customers can choose another heat source. So if we look at some of these market challenges, it is our belief that the shift to um, low temperature district heating could help us solve some of these market challenges. But you need to look at new business models. Um, in, uh, if we start, when, when we talk about business models, we of course have to start looking at a conventional, uh, a business model for conventional district heating. And um, you can say that the conventional business model, in a conventional business model, the most important customer or the customer that is really driving the, um, the that is really driving the, the business model are the large building owners. Uh, and the business logic of a classical business model for district heating uh, is based on economies of scale. And this means that the district heating companies are selling large quantities of energy and they're producing large quantities of energy. And they have a certain number of customers who require large quantities of energy and they also bring big income back to the district heating company. And this is needed to pay for for the relatively large investments in district heating. Uh, we call this strategy push as well. There's a, uh, and the product that is being pushed is heat supply, which is very easy for the customer to use and to consume um, at any point. The key resources owned by the district heating company uh, are the production units and the distribution network. And here we are showing the, of course, uh, the fossil fuel uh, energy sources or energy plants, but here it's also common to use biomass and waste incineration, for instance. Uh, if we would plot this business model in a business model canvas, which is the most commonly used business model tool, it could look like this. Uh, and I can start with saying that the business model canvas contains of nine different um, sections. Uh, which cover different parts parts of the business model. And I have divided this in, into two orange uh, uh, rectangles where the left-hand side uh, covers the part of the business model that takes place in-house at the district heating company. Um, and the, the uh, sections to the right, they show the customer side. Which, uh, which is about the customer relation and um, uh, the price model. So if we look, uh, if we start looking at the in-house section, we see that some of the key activities in a traditional business model for, um, for a district heating operator includes the generation of heat, distribution of heat and maintenance of the system. The key resources are the often large scale production plants and of course the grid. And there are very large fixed costs in such a system, which needs to be covered by the customers. 
If we look to the right, the main value proposition or the main product that they are selling to the customer is heat and hot water. And they have a very simple relationship with the customer where they mainly communicate through the invoice that is perhaps sent once a month. Um, and the revenues and the income they will get is, I mean, to a large extent built on, on fixed income, but it's also quite large revenues since um, uh, they will have many large building owners connected to the system. If we then look at how would this shift if we uh, shift to a low temperature district heating system, then all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more complex. Uh, and I have highlighted a few words in bold, uh, in bold letters, uh, which I will mention a, a bit more. If we look at the key activities, the district heating company, they will still work with uh, generating energy, they will distribute the energy and they will maintain, uh, they will work with maintenance. But um, we have also written service as a quite important activity for the district heating provider. When you shift to low temperature district heating, the margins in the system will be, will be lower. Um, and um, there's not as much acceptance for, for uh, what you would call technical problems at the customer if they need a certain temperature. Uh, so it could be that the district heating provider will include more, more services to the customer um, in the agreement that they have with the customer. It could be that we, we don't want any faulty substations or heat exchanger at the customer side. So maybe the district heating provider will have some type of service package that they will offer to the customers. To some of the customers, they might also offer something close to ESCO services to be able to provide the uh, low temperature district heating to a building that previously has been connected to high temperature district heating. Uh, if you look at the key resources, they are quite similar, but the production units will be a bit more diverse because all of a sudden we are not as dependent on the large scale production units. We could also have smaller scale production units like solar thermal uh, plants, for instance. Uh, we will have more collaborations and key partnerships because previously the district uh, heating operator could do a lot of the work themselves. They had the plants, they had the district heating grid, but all of a sudden they might be dependent on companies supplying surplus heat uh, and prosumers. So they need to have a much tighter relationship with more third party uh, producers of energy in such a scenario. And that is of course also a possibility because that will help the shift to more sustainable energy sources. And that is one of the market challenges that we have shown previously. Uh, this will also lead to more variation uh, in costs in the internal cost structure, because all of a sudden the district heating company will not only supply heat from this big production uh, plants, which they have invested in themselves. They can also buy heat from the third party who's responsible for their own investments. So it, it could lead to a different cost structure. When it comes to the relationship to the uh, customers, it can become a bit more frequent and educational. Um, again, looking at the example in Halmstad, for instance, where they're now building out a low temperature grid they need to have a very clear dialogue with their customers and the company that are building new houses in the area, because maybe now the building owner should not plan for uh, just one substation, one heat exchanger in the building. Maybe they want, or it's better to choose one substation uh, per apartment. And that of course needs to be included already in the planning stage of the building. So it, it becomes a bit more a two-way relationship with the customer. Uh, when it comes to the value proposition, we also think that this will become a bit more different when changing to low temperature district heating, but this could also be a way for traditional district heating to stay relevant for more customers. Um, and in the low temp project, we have developed a new tool that can help district heating operators to 
define and identify new value propositions for their customers. Um, and uh, as an example, uh, for certain value proposition, they can also see which key resources and key activities are required and which key partnerships are required to deliver certain value to the customer. And we said, or I said uh, previously that in a, in a traditional or conventional business model for district heating, the, the main value proposition has been heat and hot water. But maybe that will not be enough in the future. Maybe um, a customer, they want fossil free or renewable heat instead. Or maybe they want uh, a stable indoor temperature. Maybe they want to have a climate neutral heating of their building and it should always be 22 degrees. Maybe that is the new offer that a district heating operator could provide. And that also means that they have to move into the building and offer more services to the customer. Um, so we have looked a bit at the, uh, what the economic framework is and what is, what, what could be uh, possible solutions when, when choosing a different business model. But the question is still, is low temperature district heating uh, profitable? And what could be potential funding structures? Um, and one thing that we can say is that one common financial obstacle for district heating that is also shared for low temperature district heating is that it often requires large upfront capital. Uh, and that means that there is lack of profit profitability short term. Uh, in this illustration that you see, um, in, uh, you have um, an example of what the negative cash flows or the cost is for low temperature district heating system, where I uh, is um, symbolizing the investment costs and O and M are symbolizing the operate and, and maintain, operation and maintenance costs. And after a certain period of time, you of course want to reach um, um, break even. And that is shown in, um, in the blue, um, um, yeah, in, in the blue um, column, which is called R2. And after that, of course, you want to start make, to make profit from your district heating system. But maybe your investment horizon, uh, of course, that is not uh, infinite. It needs, in a certain number of years, you need to have reached um, an equilibrium, a break even. And to be able to analyze this or to analyze if you actually have a funding gap in that time, we have, uh, or our partner BTU has developed a tool to calculate or to determine the economic efficiency of planned low temperature district heating projects. And it is an Excel tool that is based on a previous tool that AGFV and BTU has developed in Germany to determine the economic efficiency of district heating systems. And uh, it considers investments over a period of 20 years. So basically what we find out is after 20 years, will this system be profitable? Have we reached break even or is there a funding gap? So if it is not profitable after 20 years, we will be able to calculate the funding gap. This funding gap could be used or this uh, calculation method could be used as a proof. Uh, of the calculation when approaching authorities for external fun uh, funding or investors. And I know that this previous model has been used by at least one state in that is for a, a specific system is of course not easy and it is not easy for us to to, to tell you what would be the optimal funding of a low temperature district heating system. Because the funding structures in the economic conditions, they differ a lot between the countries in the Baltic Sea region and in Europe. Uh, some of the examples of, of differences that, that really affects the funding structure is the ownership structures, the legal framework in different countries, and 
if you are doing this investment as a new system or if you're upgrading an old system. In the low temp projects, um, we have um, gone through a lot of different possible funding structures, uh, which are introduced in one of our deliveries, which is available for you all. Uh, and um, we have also looked at some innovative funding structures, and you see some of them uh, at the bottom of this list. And one thing here, which is important to remember that if you're looking for an innovative funding structure, what is innovative in one country might be a traditional way of funding uh, district heating systems in a different country, in, in another country. And I'm thinking uh, especially of the Danish cooperatives, which are very common in the uh, district heating sector. So there's, uh, there's a possibility to find a lot of good experiences to learn from before you start working with one of these funding structures. Um, and if you want to learn more about this, there is further material available on lowtemp.eu, which is a project webpage. And here you can find the analysis tool for economic efficiency and funding gaps, and it is free of charge to use. Uh, you have the report on contracting and payment models in district heating, a study on business models and innovative funding structures, and you have the toolbox for business model development. And all of this material has been developed by BTU, Tartu Regional Energy Agency, GAY21, and Sustainable Business Hub. Thank you.